So, um, Avi Fek is a senior research software engineer in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford. And today he will uh, share his experience of developing and maintaining and supporting the research software that is being widely used in academic research and industrial projects. So, um, over to you, Abhishek. Thank you. So, uh, let me share my screen. Let's see. And yeah, I hope you can see, um, you all can see my uh, slides. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek. And then today I will talk about um, our, um, if I can move this thing aside. Uh, okay, I don't want this window here. Hmm. So do you all see that on the right hand side, there is a window with the no. participant. So I, I don't think I can move it. Does That's it... fine, we can see your screen, which we can see your slides. Okay, okay, excellent. So um, uh, today I'll share my experiences of, of developing a research software uh, in, in the last four years. So um, uh, um, we, in, in our lab, um, uh, our vision is, is to develop uh, software that is widely used by um, people in, in academic research as well as industrial uh, projects. And um, we also want to nurture open source ecosystem around this software so that uh, uh, the software itself is, is sustainable and, and has lasting impact. And then this vision is, is uh, very nicely demonstrated by, by this diagram on the top. Um, well, we are a computer vision research lab and then we build bridges with, with other um, departments, other academic disciplines uh, using open source software tools. Uh, we also uh, communicate with commercial companies and help them use our tools. And then we have an open source community um, who also uh, supports all, all these tools. So in the last four years, um, we have learned that to pursue our vision, our software should be uh, easy to install and then set up. It should be easy to use and then it should be easy to fix, modify, and extend this software. So this is what we have learned in, in the last four years. And then today in this talk, I will talk, uh, I will share um, how the development of a manual image annotation tool uh, has been a valuable learning experience for all, for us. So uh, a manual annotation tool, as you can see on the right hand side in this video, is, is a tool that allows you to define and describe regions in an image. Um, so now it's defining a, a region and then describing it with, with different uh, metadata. So that is what uh, a manual image annotation tool is. So we'll look into all these three uh, key learnings uh, in the subsequent slides. So let's first uh, talk about easy to install and set up. So here is an anecdote uh, from, from 2016 um, from, from our research lab. So. Um, a DPhil student in our research lab spent several hours uh, to, to install and set up a manual administration tool uh, in, in a Mac laptop of, of another DPhil student who was from the humanities department. Now the manual annotation tool was an essential part of a collaborative project that was happening between our research lab and then the department of humanities and then therefore this installation was taking place. Now being a computer vision lab, we, we need a manual annotation tool to for almost all our projects, because we use these uh, manual annotation tools to develop data sets that are used to train computer vision algorithms. Therefore, uh, in, in mid-2016, we decided to build our own manual annotation tool because the existing tools were, were extremely difficult to install and set up for, for a non-technical user. Um, so our requirements at that time were very simple to state. But, but it, it was very complex to deliver. So our requirements were up and running in less than a minute. So you should be able to install and set up the software in less than a minute. And it should be easy to use for non-technical users. So think about users who do not know how to follow complex installation steps. 
as we explored our options, uh, we stumbled on, on the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript offline application uh, platform offered by almost all standard web browsers, I mean, all operating systems. So um, this is what we um, came up with um, in, in, as an early prototype. So this is around 34 lines of code uh, combining together HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And um, this, this is a minimal image annotation tool. So let me quickly show you how it does its work. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting all this code and then here I'm creating a new text document saying um, it's an HTML file. And then I copy and paste everything in, in this text file. So I just pasted it and now I'm saving it. So I, I close this window and now I open this in a web browser. So I'm opening this uh, file in a Firefox web browser. So you, you can see that there is an image uh, and then now I can um, click my mouse and drag my mouse around and then draw a box. And then at the bottom, you'll see the coordinates of, of this box. So I can draw many boxes. And then all the coordinates um, gets um, stored here. So going back to my slides, um, sorry. Okay, I have to see this one, yeah. So going back to my slide, the, the point of this demo was that with this 34 lines of code, uh, you can build a basic manual annotation tool that runs in any web browser. Um, let me quickly explain to you what, what this code is about. So. Um, this one um, is uh, uh, the line which, which draws the image uh, on, on the web browser. And the second one is, is um, it, it draws a canvas over the image. And then uh, the top one here, this, this is a basic CSS that ensures that the image and then the canvas lies on top of each other. Uh, this line here, it, it ensures that um, the, the canvas has the same size as, as that of the image. And then the, uh, and the lines on, on the bottom, um, it, it, it records uh, the mouse events like, like mouse press and then mouse up. And then this is how it records where, we, where you pressed uh, the mouse and then dragged it and then, then released the mouse. So this, is, this is what is essential to record the user interaction with, with the image. And basically this is what, what you need to do, um, make a manual annotation tool. So that was quite exciting when, when we stumbled on, on this. Um, and then in the last four years, what we have been doing is uh, basically extending this min minimal uh, manual annotation tool in, in multiple ways. So that we have self-contained uh, offline applications for annotation of images and then videos. Um, in the screenshot in the bottom, um, I'm showing the, the file name and the file size of, of our application. And then you'll note that all these files fit, fit in less than 400 kilobytes of, of uh, the HTML size, HTML file. And then they are all offline applications, which means that you don't need an internet uh, connection to, to use these. And then uh, as, as we had uh, earlier defined our requirements, all these tools can be can be simply um, run by, by opening them in a web browser. So now I'll quickly show you a demo of, of these tools that, that I'm talking about. So um, is there this one somewhere? So um, the, the first one is, is image annotation tool. And then you'll see that I, I, I'm opening it in a web browser. And then that's all it needs to, to start, to install and to set up this, this application. It, it, it runs right away in any browser. And then you can start drawing boxes. You can define metadata as you want. And then you can export these in, in any format that you want. Uh, you can zoom into the image. You can look into the details of, of the image. Um, so going back to my slides, um, uh, the, the important point here is that, that all the 
things that you need in a manual annotation tool. You can have in, in this um, um, less than 400 kilobytes of, of offline application that is done in your browser. Um, maybe I missed to show another demo. So th this is uh, more interesting. So this is a subtitle annotator. So on the right-hand side, you see a video there. Um, let me reduce the volume so that we don't have echo. So this is, this is the video. And then in the bottom, you see, you'll see all the, I'm just zooming it a bit. So you, at the bottom, you'll see all the subtitle text. You can um, resize them. You can move them around. You can delete them. Um, and then you can edit the text as well. Um, so this whole thing is running in, in, uh, as an offline app HTML application and then less than 400 kilobytes. Um, so coming back to my slides. Um, so what, what we learned is, is that um, someone has to spend time. Uh, it could be either your users who collectively spend countless hours in, in installing and then setting up your application or it could be you as a developer who, who will spend certain amount of time to make the whole process frictionless and then quick. For us, it was, it was not a difficult decision because we knew that we wanted to have a software that, that is very easy to install and set up. And then that's why this um, uh, choice of platform uh, of HTML helped us um, gain this uh, or, or fulfill this requirement. Uh, now we move on to the, uh, the second uh, learning that, that we had, which is easy to use. Now, how do you make something that is easy to use? The, this is a very simple question, but, uh, and, and also maybe sometimes simple to answer, but, but it is very difficult to, to, to come up with, with a concrete answer. Um, we think you can make something easy to use by using it every day. So when we were developing this manual annotation tool, we were using it every day in our projects. So um, a lot of uh, researchers in our lab, they use it every day to build data sets for, for computer vision, uh, to train their um, neural networks, to, to develop computer vision models. So we were using it every day and therefore we were learning what was uh, missing, what is great about this software and then what we need to do. The second is, um, um, once you talk to the people who use uh, the software, this gives a lot of insight into what needs to be done, what is missing, uh, what is working well. So humans uh, who use your software, they, they are the best um, way to get, get feedback on, on your software. So talk to them, that, that's very important. And then finally, when, when, you have, when you hear all these things from people talking about your software, you have to act on them uh, and then makes you that um, you are addressing uh, the issues that, that uh, people report to you. Um, our application used um, most standard HTML components. So almost everyone who uses the internet and who has used a website, they are familiar with the components that we use in our user interface. So that, that gives, gives us an advantage uh, that our users already know uh, what, what certain um, uh, tools in our application do. Um, we always use the concept of minimalism and then simplicity to drive all our decisions. So we don't want to uh, add things just because someone has requested it. Uh, we, we decide on whether um, that um, functionality breaks the existing uh, simple nature of the tool and then the simple workflow that it supports. And then we, we are very careful to only use the, the features of, of the HTML platform that are supported widely by, by most web browsers uh, so that our tools run, run without any issue in, across all the different uh, standard web browser. And then um, we don't have much documentation, but, but the way we provide a um, guide to our users is, is using this um, concise user guide that you see at the bottom here uh, that appears whenever you are doing something. So when, when a user has selected a region in, 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 in an image, uh, they get a guide at the bottom saying that what you can do with the selected region. 
we have found that this is very useful for, for users, and then that's why it appears uh, most of the time. Um, because we designed our um, software tools from ground up, we have a lot of flexibility in designing anything that we want. So we handle our own mouse events, we draw our graphics, and then therefore we can build anything that, that we need in, in this application. And then before we release a, a version of our tool, a lot of um, researchers in our lab have already tested it many times um, and, 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 and gone through the uh, bug reporting, bug fixing. So uh, our users mostly, they get to see something that is more stable and, and, and easy to use. And then our tool, the video annotation is, is not any different than image annotation. So this, this is the power that um, the HTML platform has, has given us. It, it can display uh, any image and then any type of video um, without any issue. And then we, our application has lots of keyboard shortcuts, which, which makes the um, whole process very easy. Um, if you want to make something easy to use, um, the, the recommended way is to have a user experience developer in your team who will help you def uh, develop a user interface that is easy to use and, and intuitive um, and has an intuitive user interface. But because we didn't have a UX developer in our team, we, we learned this art uh, by, by looking at multiple online resources. So um, for example, this uh, MIT Open Courseware was really very useful in, in getting the basics. And then there are a lot of material online that, that one can refer to. So, but this is very important that, that you learn the art of, of designing user interfaces and then developing the user experience. So this is very important. And finally, the, the, the third learning that, that we had in this software uh, is, is that the software should be easy to fix, modify and, and extend. Now, uh, we have a lot of uh, users who not only report issues to us, but they often contribute uh, code to fix the issue. And they also contribute code to add new features that, that, that improve the software. Um, a reason behind that is, is because we have made our code uh, easy to understand. Um, we have made our code open source. And then we have made our code more easily accessible to, to users when, when they are using this application. So um, as an example, we don't uh, minify our J JavaScript code. So minification is the process where, where you um, remove all the parts of a code that are not necessary for, for achieving the functionality of the code, but that are there for, for say, um, improving the readability of the code. So we don't minify, we, we let it be um, what it is so that when you are using this application and then if you spot an issue, uh, you can, if, if you have the background, uh, you can open, um, the web uh, debugging console, you can look at, at the element that is causing the issue and then see what code it is um, calling. And then with, with some basic knowledge about JavaScript, you, you can easily fix uh, most of the things. And then that's what we have been seeing uh, with our users. Um, as, as I said, we, we have developed everything from ground up. So we do not um, use any external libraries. Um, so you only need to know the core JavaScript, the basic JavaScript to understand our code and then, then upgrade this code to fit, you, uh, to fit your requirements. Um, uh, our code does not need anything other than a standard web browser. And then because we, we have highly optimized our code uh, to only contain the things that we need, we can fit everything in a very small package, which is uh, less than 400 kilobytes. So you can send this full application to your colleague in an email, and then they can get up and running in less than a minute. Um, th this is a, an ongoing process where, where we are always exploring ways to write code that, that improves um, understanding uh, for, for other programmers who want to use this code or who want to fix this code. And this is an ongoing process, and, but, but we are always um, very, um, careful about writing our code so that um, other uh, people can understand them. Um, as I said, we, we are an open source uh, software and therefore we have 
merge it and an open source ecosystem around uh, the software. So we have an issue portal where people come and report uh, issues, contribute uh, their fixes, they request for new features there. Um, and then this is this is the the playground where they come and, and, and uh, report what, what they have found. We also have a portal where users can contribute code uh, and then help improve the software. And then so far, a lot of users have contributed code to, our, uh, to this. Um, so that, that, that was, those were the three things that, that we learned. So to recap, um, um, to, to pursue our vision of, of developing software tools uh, that is used in, in multiple academic disciplines and then in different industrial sectors, uh, we learned that our research software tools should be easy to install and set up, should be easy to use, and then should be easy to fix, modify, and extend for anyone. Um, but, but of course, all these um, depend on, on there being a demand for the tools that you're developing. So um, if, you, if the things that you're developing um, is only for a small group of people, um, you may have different uh, priorities and then these may not necessarily be uh, important for you. But for us, because we were targeting a larger group of people, larger group of users, these um, points proved extremely uh, useful. So looking at my time, uh, okay. So uh, now we are in the final parts of, our, for, of this talk. Um, and then where I want to talk how these learnings helped us pursue our vision. So if you remember from, from my initial slides, we, we had this vision that we wanted to um, our tools to be used in, in academic research as well as commercial companies. So um, in the last four years, a lot of uh, research projects um, have used our tools for, for their research. Uh, <clears throat> So we know this because um, those researchers have written back to us, often thanking us for developing this tool, and then sometimes asking us questions. So therefore, we know that the researchers from these universities and many more all over the world, they are, they are using these tools and finding it useful. A lot of companies have also contacted us because they want to extend uh, the software and, uh, or integrate the software in their existing uh, products. Uh, sometimes they, they let us know that they have done this. Sometimes they ask us questions on, on what is the best strategy to include these tools in their platform and then we help them. And then therefore we know that these companies as well as many other companies, they are using um, our tools. And then most importantly, um, we have a lot of um, um, general users um, who just use it uh, to, to do um, their, their work and then since this uh, software was released in, in 2017, uh, it has been used uh, nearly 4 million times uh, by, by users all over the world. So we think um, that, that um, the, the, the steps that we have taken, the three points that, that I discussed, they are helping us um, achieve this vision of reaching people uh, in, in different parts of the world, in different uh, academic sectors, in different um, commercial sectors. So. Um, Therefore, we wanted to share um, all these uh, learnings that, that we uh, had in the last four years so that, that um, others who have similar um, uh, vision and priorities, they, they can also um, um, gain from, from our experiences in the last four years. So that was it. Um, uh, that, that's what we learned and that's what we wanted to share with you all. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions uh, from you. Um, so back to you, Dave, and the control. Okay. Great. In the chat window, Great. I see a question. Yes, yes, I was going to, to mention I was that. Interested. The, the question is from uh, Dave. So Dave asked, uh, I was interested to understand your open source model. What license is it distributed under? How do you promote the application? Or has it uh, built through word of mouth? Uh, thank you, Dave. It's a very um, interesting question. So. Our open source model is, is based around the BSD license. So it's uh, our open source license, which uh, allows um, unrestricted use of our software in, in commercial as well as academic research. So there is no licensing needed. Um, 
And then therefore, any company, any research lab is, is free to use the software in any way that one they want or, or extend the software in any way that one. Um, the second part of the question is, uh, how do you promote the application or has it built uh, through word of mouth? So um, we usually um, um, give talks uh, at uh, summer school uh, conferences. Um, a lot of uh, researchers in our lab, they use it. Um, so when they write papers uh, about it, they, they cite our tool. So that, that could be a way uh, how people know about it. And um, we have seen that a lot of people not related to us, uh, they write about this software and they make videos about this software. They, they create tutorials about this software online, about how to extend this software, how to use this software. So in general, people, um, when, when they like a software, when it is useful to them, um, they become uh, your promoter. So they write about you, they tweet about you, they share uh, about you, and then that's how it spreads. So in a way, um, it is through the word of mouth, um, but but I don't have a, a recipe for, for how, how um, this software reached a lot of people. So um, yeah, I, I hope that answered your question there. Okay, I have another question from Andrew. So Andrew is asking, are there any features you'd like to include in your tool that are limited by your choice of HTML JavaScript? Or would you consider extending your uh, HTML JavaScript if necessary? So that, that, that's the question from Andrew. Um, so far, um, we have not seen any limitations uh, other than some, some of the constraints uh, that are imposed by web browsers um, for, for uh, the security concern. So for example, um, our application cannot access um, um, the, the, the file system. So a user has to uh, select uh, all the files that needs to be uh, annotated using this tool. So we cannot do that automatically as, as you have commonly in, in applications. So that is a constraint. Um, but, but I think um, um, uh, there, there are ways to, to simplify this process. And then so far our users have been uh, fairly well with this constraint. Um, uh, in terms of other limitations, the, uh, currently we are working to um, have um, computer vision models. These are deep neural networks that uh, assist human annotators in, in, in the manual annotation process. So imagine that you are annotating a video and in one of the frames you have drawn a box around the human face. Um, currently, you have to draw a box in, in multiple frames manually. So that is quite uh, time consuming. But, but there, are, there are computer vision models that automatically track certain objects in, in different frames of video. So we want to use these models running in, in, uh, in the web browser and then helping the human annotator to, to simplify the annotation process. Um, so currently, we are working to have um, object trackers and then object recognizers um, running in the web browser itself to, to do all these tasks. But, but um, it is more challenging to implement these uh, models in, in the web browser as compared to say other platforms like Python or, or TensorFlow. So that is a challenge that we are facing, but, but we are trying to overcome this challenge instead of uh, abandoning uh, the great benefits and uh, that, that the HTML platform has brought to us. We have one more question from Matthew. So um, uh, this is the final question. Uh, we are already out of time. So um, Gabriel, can I answer this final question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so this is from did. Matthew. Um, so Matthew says, this is a nice example, but I wonder about packaging software that might have more complex dependencies. Not everything can be JavaScript wrapped in HTML. How do you feel, fulfill the e easy to install in that circumstances? Um, so uh, Matthew, uh, this is a very good question. So, so, so far we have not found uh, um, uh, this problem of packaging. So, so far we, we have been successful in packaging everything in a single HTML file that is less than 400 kilobytes. So it includes all the icons we have, it in includes all the JavaScript we have, it includes all the CSS we have. Um, 
it includes everything. Uh, so um, if you um, open our application and then view the source code, you'll see that it is packed with everything. Um, I, I hope that that answered your question, but but I'm, I'm not sure. So maybe you can um, ask uh, if, if that didn't answer your question. If, if that did, thank you very much everyone for uh, giving, giving me this opportunity to, to talk about our software. Thank you very much.